This is the Earth Science Classroom. Welcome back to the channel. This video is on faults and what a fault is. In this video, we're going to discuss the word origin. Where does it come from? Had it come to be a term in geology? Looking at where these faults occur in terms of the locations around the world in relation to plate boundaries and plate tectonics. Then looking at the anatomy of the fault, so what's in a fault line, the terminology, and looking at how we characterize each fault and looking at the types of faults that we get in general. It derives from the 18th and 19th century. You had coal miners who at various depths around Europe and North America, in Australia, you had these miners looking at the rock layers, obviously looking for coal beds and certain rock strata that would indicate where the coal is and how to extract the coal. And they would look at all these different sequencing of rocks. Let's say we have this rock layer sequence and these horizontal beds and somewhere in this coal mine you'd find the coal reserves and deposits. And let's say you have different rocks. Sequence of sedimentary rocks. What the coal miners would find on occasion would be a different sequence with the same rock layers but in different orders or they're slanted or at what's called an offset. So these rocks are offset by a certain distance and they look like this. So what the coal miners would look at and observe by these rock layers would be this, this offset where this yellow dashed rock would be offset like this and each of them would be offset by a certain distance and a certain angle. And this red line would show where there's a break or a fracture in the rock layers and that this side over here to the right had been either moved upwards or this side on the left had moved down. So there was relative motion on one side of this, this rock sequence to show an offset and the miners would coin the phrase fault as to show how it was broken, basically the sequence was broken. So where are these faults located? Now first, most of the earthquakes we're going to look at in this playlist, we need a fault or a fault line to activate, to release the energy to create these earthquakes in the first place. We need stress and strain and deformation to create the fault lines. Now where does this happen? This happens usually around plate boundaries to do with plate tectonics. Now 90% of the earthquakes on this earth occur around or very near to a plate boundary, whether it's convergent plate boundary, transform or divergent. So these plate boundaries play a key role in where the fault lines are going to be, which then in turn create the earthquakes of different magnitudes. So as you can see in this diagram, you've got the basic major and minor plates uh, located on the Earth's surface, and these plates are being moved by convection currents, and this line and these arrows kind of show or indicate the motion of the plates and where there will be transform plate boundaries like here classically in the San Andreas Fault Lines transform plate. You may have some transform plates around Europe and the minor plates there and some also uh, the Scotia plates and the Caribbean plates are so all areas of transform plate boundaries. Now there are transform plate boundaries in between the divergent ridges, mid-ocean ridges and also around the uh, East African Rift Valley zone right here and it also extends up into the Middle East as a northern section. But the main part, the most famous part, is in Eastern Africa. So there are sections of transform plate boundaries and convergent plate boundaries where the majority of the larger earthquakes are found. Now these faults are found along here. Now if we get more detailed and we look at the Atlantic Mid-Ocean Ridge or MOR and we look at this linked or connected ridge system as we see here shown by this purple color right here and this kind of offset these natural offsets and in between you have these transfer faults and transform faults and transform boundaries in between the divergent spread center or constructive plate margin and as the plates are being stretched through tensile stress and being moved by the uprising magma and lava and basaltic magma, the crust, which is very brittle, is going to break. So you get all of these, these fault lines being created. 
and you get all these fracture zones that extend parallel and also perpendicular to the spreading center all along the ocean floor all around the ridge system. So you can get very large fault systems and also very small intricate fault systems in between each boundary and around the boundary. So first, before we get into the anatomy, let's just basically give a description of what a fault is. So a fault is a discrete fracture. And we get a fracture from our stress, resulting in strain and various levels of deformation, resulting in various limits and brittle rock creating fractures. And what you need is consistent and relative motion after the fracture has been created, therefore turning this area, this zone, this break in the rock into a fault line. But you need the fracture, obviously, to occur in different ways and different lengths, whether it be discrete or a blind fault or a listric fault, which is curved, or a diagonal fault, which is dip slip versus a vertical fault, which is strike slip. But you need that fracture of different areas and, and sizes, and also you need the motion. You need the movement on either side to create our fault line. So that leads us to a very simple diagram. So first we have a block diagram, and this means that there are two blocks, and I'm gonna put block one and block two. Now block one, this is gonna be based on how we calculate the foot wall. This is gonna be the hanging wall, and it's the one that has the movement in this situation with this generic fault. Number two, if it's not the hanging wall, it has to be the foot wall, which is stationary. So we can identify from this where the fault is. And the fault line and the fault line is in blue right here. And if I was to extend it in a three-dimensional way, it would be like that. So this is the angled flat planar surface of which this is the fault line and the hanging wall is going to move up or down along this diagonal flat surface that we call the fault plane and also the fault line. So it's the fault line right here and the fault plane is this plane surface right here that I've highlighted. This will be the, the fault plane and plane means flat surface. Now in terms of the this type this would be a dip slip. And in terms of definition, dip would be the angle of the fault line or the fault plane. And the slip would be the movement or the displacement. The angle right here, this would be our dip angle, also called the inclination and also called the plunge. So different words. So this could be anything uh, There could be a high angle versus a low angle. Let's say this one would be, let's say, 45 degrees. This would be a 45 degree angle, making it a high angle. If I made it, made this blue line more a uh, gentle gradient, like here, for example, let's say it's 30 degrees, this would be a low angle dip slip fault. Now, the movement would dictate the type of fault. So if I had movement whereby this hanging wall is moving up or down relative to the foot wall, if it moves up, it will be called a reverse dip slip or also a thrust based on the angle. A low angle is thrust, a higher angle will be reverse. And if it goes downward, so let's put upward or against gravity, goes downward or with gravity, this would be called a normal dip slip. And the stresses resulting in this kind of movement would be normal, would be a tensile strength where it's been pulled apart, and reverse would be a compressional stress with being pushed together. So other features, you might get this exposed area of rock caused by displacement of the hanging wall, and this is called the fault scarp. You might have movement horizontal with the horizontal movement or displacement. This is called strike in terms of a strike slip fault whereby the fault line would be vertical or near vertical. It's near vertical, it would be called a wrench fault. Now, strike slip, the strike is the displacement, horizontal displacement, and also this can be looked at in terms of the bearings and where it's going in direction, which would be zero to 360 degrees in terms of the bearing. And this is looking at the azimuth, which is relating to magnetic north, 
And then we can also look at the throw and the heave. The throw would be how far the hanging wall has gone down. So this is the throw or the distance. And the heave would be how far the hanging wall along the fault line, fault plane, has moved forward. So throw and the heave. We can also look at the, the trend and how the direction of movement based on horizontal line and the azimuth and also look at maybe an oblique fault which includes two distinct movements and you can discuss discuss where along this fault line you would actually have what's called the focus or the hypocenter which is the location where the earthquake is actually created the release of that elastic energy in the form of seismic waves traveling through the earth at different speeds both p wave s wave l wave and r wave going through the earth and being experienced as an earthquake on the surface so this focus is somewhere along the fault line at a certain depth based on location and composition and we can see and calculate where that is and the point uh, right above on the surface would be called the epicenter so these are our four main types. We have three types of dip slip. Normal is where the hanging wall is going down, which is diagram one, the block diagrams. Diagram two and three, they're both reversed, but depends on the angle. If it's a 45 degree angle, it's reverse as shown here. If it's a lower angle around 30 degrees, it's called a thrust. Now strike slip, we don't have a foot wall and hanging wall. We have a vertical or near vertical fault line or fault plane. Therefore, it's just the left and right blocks. One is moving or both are moving relative to each other, different speeds, different angles. So if it's a left block, it's moving relative to the right, we call it sinistral. If it's a right, we call it dextral. Then we have our oblique fault. Oblique fault is we have not a dip or strike, it's in between, but you have two movements. You have a combination of movements. In this case, in this diagram, looking at the hanging wall is also displaced in a strike slip with a right lateral and the hang wall is displaced downwards in a normal fault. So normal plus right lateral, which is oblique. So these are the main types of faults. And to understand the fault and what the fault is, we can discuss all the different characteristics and then discuss the movement, which will dictate the type of fault that we get as shown here. This is the Earth Science Classroom. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed the content. Uh, check out more videos on our channel and don't forget to subscribe. Thank you again.